Ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, welcome to this special edition of The Gunman where you will be seeing me transform a boring old Nintendo 64 into a work of art as you see here. So hang around for the next 45 or so minutes and enjoy. So this thing here, I've already pulled it apart. Um, it wasn't working. Uh, you can see it's had a bit of a tough life. Here's the case here. Um, the reset button there had been all chewed out. It looks like someone's like attacked that with a knife pretty hardcore, some kid at one point. So it wasn't turning on at all. Um, I wasn't getting anything out of it. Um, well, I did get a power light out of it before. But then what I decided to do is just uh, clean it out. And I got this case off, I got this heat sink off as well. And um, I managed to just give it a really good clean out. There was like oil, there was a fair bit of dust. It wasn't like that bad. Like I've probably seen worse on some other YouTube videos. And um, this is all I had at the time. It was just some nail polish cleaner from the missus and it did the job fine. So I just got some little um, Q-tips uh, or, you know, uh, cotton wool buds or whatever you want to call them um, and just brushed away uh, with some of that nail polish remover and uh, a few tissues and stuff gave it a really good clean down spent a bit of time on it just loosely put it back together um, in the case and it was working again so that's really great news like I wasn't holding high hopes with it like the way I looked at it if, if it didn't work it could just be a bit of a display uh, a display 64 anyway so um, I'm obviously going to have to use some body filler to fill up uh, the reset button. While I'm at it, um, I think I might even flush some of these Nintendo logos out. Um, the on and off switch here, um, and also the actual switch itself. I might even get rid of that where it says power there. Um, it should look pretty cool. So I've got like a basic idea of what I want to do. I want to do a, a bit of a 007 design and have the um, Nintendo logos here. Um, it's going to take a bit of time and it's something that I want to make look really good. Like, I, I don't want to have, like, daggy edges around um, because I was rushing it or anything. If I do get something that I'm not happy with, I'll back mask it on the other side and touch it up with an airbrush or something like that. So, um, as far as getting into the console, like, if you're, if you're at home and you say, hey, I want to do this as well, it's pretty straightforward really like if you know how to use a uh, screwdriver um, you should be able to suss it out um, so what you will need though is a game bit so I got these off eBay they cost like four dollars seventy for both of them I think one of them is like one of them will fit uh, like the cartridges and one of them will fit the console itself so um, very straightforward and you, you need a couple of Phillips heads as well there's actually like yeah shit loads of Phillips heads all through the heat sink on this case is um, on the console itself so it takes quite a few screws to get in there and if you like if you want a bit of a tutorial on how to remove and sort of like refit all the parts off your 64 um, this isn't the place to come this is more just going to be the paintwork there's there's enough good videos out there on that that it's, it, I just don't see it worth my time doing a tutorial on how to clean your console and how to remove and refit it. This is just uh, basically focused on the paintwork. But a person that I can recommend going to is Adam Karalik. I'm actually a subscriber of him. I've been a subscriber of his for quite some time. Um, and I watch quite a lot of his videos. He's, um, yeah, does qu quite in-depth videos on, uh, you know, just gaming and consoles and stuff like that. So... Then when I was actually researching how to um, clean and fix a Nintendo 64, it was actually one of his videos that came out. I believe it was actually one of his earlier videos that he's ever even done. So, but the um, information on there still stands. So if you do need to like figure out how to get in and yeah, clean your 64, I recommend going over to see Adam Karalek's channel and I'll probably put a link down in the description too. I guess we may as well get to work and start painting this thing. So for most of the rest of this video, I'll just be down in the bottom corner of the uh, screen and taking you guys through uh, the steps that I'm doing. So first up, when I got into work, I decided to give it another good wipe down with some wax and grease remover, otherwise known as Prepsol. It's a bit of a softer solvent than thinners. If I was to go and use gum wash thinners, it would most likely start melting the plastic. So it's not something that you want to do. 
Um, I did get a bit of a uh, toothbrush type thing and brush away all the inside of the uh, indentations of the logo just to clean it out before I did fill them up. What One thing I did notice is that um, from brushing away, even with a, a soft solvent like Prepsol, um, it did start furring around it. So if you are doing a similar thing um, and you're not planning on flushing out all of the uh, low indentations of where it says Nintendo and Power, and all that kind of thing. I would recommend being very careful with them. Maybe just squirt some solvent in there and then just blow it out with an air blower rather than actually brushing into it because the plastic um, can start, uh, yeah, furring up and fraying a little bit. But anyway, first up, I decided to get some 180 grit and just attack all the areas that needed a repair or the anywhere that needed filler first. So um, most of this lid or the top section of the console is going to get some two-pack primer and plastic primer, um, but I needed to do the uh, filler repairs first. So for most of the bottom of the console itself, I just plastic primed and painted straight over the top of it. Um, so I'll give you guys a good look at the system later on in the video, but from now on, we'll just uh, yeah, take you through each step. I do apologize about the, the dark workshop there. This is the middle of summer in Perth and we had a couple of days where this uh, tropical cyclone ended up coming down and it was, um, yeah, really cloudy and pissing down rain for a couple of days. So very unlike Perth in the middle of summer, but um, yeah, this is a little bit of a dark corner in the workshop and um, even with the lights on it, it still can be a touch of a dark dark shop, especially when it's uh, cloudy outside. So just using some two-pack fine filler here. You could um, go for some plastic filler. However, I've found on rigid plastics, things like this, um, it's not going to be getting knocked around like a bumper bar or anything like that. So just standard two-pack uh, knifing putty, fine filler. Uh, fine filler is going to be perfect for this job. I wouldn't go and use like a rough filler or anything like that. More chance of getting pinholes and stuff like that. And um, I've found this stuff, uh, it just sounds out a little bit easier, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the stuff I use is the Evercoat Easy Sand, I'm a bit, big fan of this uh, fine filler, so um, again, just going over that reset button, as you saw, it was pretty hammered at the start of this video, um, so I didn't really have a great deal of a choice but to fill that in and flush it out, but have no fear, it looks absolutely awesome. Just taking that time to get that filler in nice and neat that we don't get, uh, you know, too many raised sections. Like if you get, if you don't get enough in, then you're gonna be refilling, and if you get too much in, you're just gonna have a hard time sanding it out. So um, you can see those three slight raised sections on the memory extent expansion area, and there was also a couple of raised sections for the on and off uh, switch as well. Um, on the top of the console itself. So I decided to just sl slice them off with a razor blade, those raised pieces of plastic from, uh, yeah, when they made the mold. Um, and then just using a piece of 320 grit here. I started off with 180 grit on a couple of the uh, other sections, like where the logo was. I wanted to go a little bit coarser. So yeah, this is uh, definitely much longer than most of my videos, but I do hope I'm able to keep you guys interested the entire video. I must admit, I haven't been that excited to make a YouTube video for quite some time now. It does get to the point where you just feel like you're going over and over the same thing again. However, this was a really enjoyable project for me. I was getting up early, going to work early, working through my morning teas, working through my lunch breaks, staying back for an hour here and there just to get this thing done because I was really excited to um, get this thing painted and honestly, I'm really happy with the results. So again, just using some um, uh, 180 grit, as I mentioned before on these these areas that were a bit, bit rougher, they needed a bit more sanding and finishing everything off even all of the fillers getting finished off with 500 grit. Um, just less chance of having the uh, sanding scratches, the primers shrink back into those scratches and yeah, possibly sand them later down the track. As I said there, just uh, cutting off that on and off toggle switch near the switch. 
Um, I know up's on, I know down is off. One thing that I was uh, quite conscious of is making sure that these buttons actually still work when the console goes back together. So I didn't want to get it all finished off and then try and put the on and off switch in there and it doesn't move because I put too much paint in there. Um, and same with the reset button. So what I actually did is got the sandpaper around there and opened it up a little bit. No matter how good you are, you're still going to get a bit of a build up in paint and especially on a job like this where I did want to flow coat it and yeah, later on in the video you will see me actually flow coating this um, because where I'm putting all the logos and the stencils are going, there's going to be a slightly raised section from the base coat uh, stage. So I'll put clear coat on it first, uh, put a nice amount there so that I can sand that down and then reapply some more clear so that the finished product is a completely flat surface without any raised sections. Um, but yeah, I'm just uh, sanding the entire thing down with 500 grit. The Nintendo 64 does have a slight bit of a textured finish into it. So I did want to uh, remove all of that textured finish again, just so it's got a very flat surface to go over. And at the end of the day, like you could do whatever you want. Uh, and these same methods would apply whether or not you're doing it at home, uh, no matter what console you're doing, I would imagine uh, anything that's a similar sort of a plastic. You obviously still need to use some sort of a plastic primer. Um, you then want to use some sort of a two-pack primer. I wouldn't really recommend using an acrylic primer unless you absolutely have to. Um, and yeah, I would still be using all two-pack automotive paints. Um, that's, yeah, automotive paints, custom paints, basically the same thing really. Um, I'm lucky to have a workshop with all the materials that I need uh, on hand. Uh, however, if I didn't, it'd be a few hundred bucks easily worth of stuff that I'd have to purchase and um, like little things like the, the gold and the red, you can't just go down to an um, automotive paint supply and say, hey, I need just 100 mils of gold and I need 150 mils of red or whatever. Like most of the time, the minimum amount they will even mix up is half a litre. So um, usually half a litre is 50 to $80, depending where you get it from and what brand. So I can imagine it, it would start adding up. I guess that's one of the perks of being a good employee and always doing your best, working your ass off and pumping the jobs out is that when it does come time to doing your own job, the boss is going to be happy to let you do it. Um, look, if it had been any of a bigger job, like if I wanted to paint the side of my car and I was going to use like half a litre or a litre, I'd, I'd just give him 50 or $100 or whatever um, just to cover his costs. Um, but in this instance, it was literally barely even worth it, you know. So... Yeah, just using my a &I R150, one of my favourite mini guns. I use this thing every day. Um, and yeah, just got that plastic primer in there. That just needs one coat, one wet coat. You can put two on if you like. Like usually when I'm doing a bumper bar, I will put two coats on. Um, just to be sure. Just in case I didn't miss anything on the first coat mainly. Um, but next up, I'm just uh, mixing up the uh, two-pack primer. And as you may have saw, I'm putting a bit of Rocket in there. That's an awesome product. Anyone that's doing work at home probably should look into getting some, especially if they're in the colder climates. Um, but at the very start, like at this point in this video, I was kind of a little bit wary of getting this thing hot. Like I didn't really want to bake it in case it ended up melting. Um, as the job continued, I decided, yeah, I'll give it a bake and just keep an eye on it. And it is fine. So um, these things are pretty right to get up to 60 degrees and they're not going to start warping or anything. So... If you do want to give them a bake, they are pretty safe. I would imagine most consoles that are a rigid, hard plastic like this would be similar. Um, but yeah, just putting two coats of this primer on, as I said before, like I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to overload the, the material on any any of the stages. Um, so just two coats, and it's all it's not going to get blocked down or anything. So usually when you're doing a, a repair on a car, you'd want to get a 1.8 mil or a 2 mil fluid tip. Um, and just pump four coats, three to four heavy coats on, and you really want to block into it to make sure that that panel's straight. Here, I'm not doing that. I'm not looking for straightness. It's already pretty straight anyway. Um, and I just need to uh, sort of seal down those repairs and seal down uh, any of the imperfections that may have been left behind from the um, slightly textured finish. It's so, like I do get some people asking me, oh, can I use um, a 1.2 mm gun for primer absolutely you can as long as that material is thin enough to come out of a smaller fluid tip there's no reason you can't use it um, you know the only thing you might find is that you need to put a little bit more thinners in it 
Um, but even then, you can still get a thick primer out of a 1.2mm. Sometimes you just find it's going really slow. So for people doing jobs at home, if you're like, well, I don't want to go and buy a color gun, a clear gun, a primer gun, and all that stuff, um, you can either look into getting a gun that's got different size fluid tips on it, or just thin the, thin the material out a little bit more, or just deal with going a little bit slow, you know. But um, yeah, 10% is what I did uh, with this primer, and as I said, a touch of rocket. And I primed it up at lunchtime, because um, I got the repairs done in the morning, um, and then at morning tea, and when I was actually priming it up, there was, uh, you may have noticed earlier that like it was all raining and there was little bits of like overspray from the rain, I guess, like very small rain droplets coming in. I'm like, oh no, and that's why you probably saw me blowing some little bits of water out of it. So um, yeah, that was a bit of a disaster, but it, in the end I managed to sand all those uh, low spots left out and there was no water left on the inside of the paint. So that's a good thing. But yeah, water and paint don't mix. Unless it's water-based paint. <coughs> um, yeah, as I said before, just sanding it down with 500 grit again. 500 grit's right to paint over. Um, you could take it to the next step and go 800 grit if you're worried about getting sanding scratches. But um, 500 grit for solvent-based paint is usually fine. Again, if you're using water-based paint, you might want to go to that next step. Go 800 or even 1000. Um, just to ensure that you're not going to get any sanding scratches when you put your color on. For obvious reasons, I wanted to keep that awesome Nintendo 64 logo, the iconic logo at the front of the console. So I decided to um, mask around it when I did that primer. You can see I just sort of masked off that front edge. I wanted to keep the primer away from that uh, plastic logo so I didn't get a big build up of primer and then be left with a bit of an edge. So that's, that's actually why I kept it away from that edge there. And I'm just making sure I gave that plastic section at the front a good sand down to make sure it, it was nice and flat. And uh, again, I'm just giving the uh, yeah, Nintendo 64 logo a good mask up with a piece of fine line vinyl tape. Um, 3 ms always the way to go as far as masking tapes, adhesive tapes and all that kind of thing goes. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to beat 3M. This purple tape's 3M as well. Um, Yep, it's given a good mask up. And next up, we're going to be ready to start putting some of our background colors on. So as I said before, I'm lucky to work in a shop with everything at my disposal. And I'm li I just literally chose a gold that I liked on there straight off the machine. So there's no tinter at all in that other than Standox 806 Pearl Gold. And it actually does cover quite well. So it's not like I have to put five or ten coats on there to get coverage. This um, covers really well it's just straight out of the can. Um, and just put a little bit of reducer in there. Two to one is the recommended ratio. So let's put a bit of fast reducer in there so it's gonna flash off nice and quick um, so that I can mask off it. So first up, we're gonna put the gold down. Second up, we're gonna be putting the red down. We'll then actually be taking it back home so that I can put my stencils on. I'll show you guys how to apply the stencils and a few tips and tricks how to do that in a few minutes. And um, yeah, continuing on. Again, just using that R150. This is my workhorse, that thing. Like, it gets used so much at work. And it's a cheap gun. Like, I've got a, um, a pretty, pretty popular video. It's like top eight mini guns. And this thing won number one. Like, the only real letdown of that gun is the, uh, the pot on them. They're, they're just a little bit kind of janky, I guess. That's probably the right word for it. They're just not really that nice and easy to, to get on. But this is actually the second pot they've got. And even these big pots do have issues too, where the thread goes into the gun itself. Um, the plastic does actually split sometimes. The previous one I had lasted probably about eight months to a year, and it did just start leaking paint out there, so I had to get a new one. Uh, but aside from that, it can't fault the actual spray gun itself. So getting that gold down, I found a few imperfections that I wasn't quite happy with. It could have been some of those little water droplets, I think, like a couple of low spots left over from those water droplets. Um, when the water got blown out of there, it's gone and left the low spot in the paint. Which is, as I said before, I like water and paint is not good in any means. So as you can see there, it's not really um, looking that nice. So I went outside, got the heat gun onto it, dried it right down, got a piece of 800 sanding, uh, 800 softback sanding sponge, gave it a scuff back, and I uh, applied a little bit more gold on there and we're looking good again.
So this is all still um, day one. This was the Monday. This is what I got done on the Monday. I walked out of that workshop um, on Wednesday and I put this thing back together on Wednesday after respraying the entire thing. And um, I had Tuesday night off because I had to go down and help a friend. So I think I did quite well. Like the only stage that I would say, um, ideally you would probably want to leave that clear coat on a little bit longer but it didn't end up being an issue for me um just when you're flow coating you're best off letting your first coat of clear flash off for like a week or something or even just giving it a really good bake um just to make sure it gasses out um before you flow coat it but yeah for this it was perfect as you can see that uh that gold is going on a lot nicer now um after i uh did give it a bit of a scuff back and again, just doing some rough masking. These aren't edges that are gonna be getting seen or anything. This is literally just to cover the gold from getting any red on it because there's gonna be two two uh, colors underneath the decals. Um, I do have to do a white, but the decal, or sorry, the stencil does need to go down first. Yeah, like I would say the hardest thing about this job is having somewhere to do it. If, if you're just someone at home and you wanna do this, you're gonna to have to get some, like quite a lot of materials and stuff like that and equipment to do it. Um, and for me, getting the actual stencils made up. So luckily, like I, I put a post on Instagram that I'd fix my console. I think I mentioned it at the start of the video. I put a post on Instagram telling people that I'd fix my Nintendo 64 and I said, hey, I, should I flake it or should I not flake it? Everyone's saying, yeah, yeah, flake it up. Um, and then this one guy chimed in and he goes, man, like if you want to get some uh, stencils made up, I've got a stencil cutter. And I'm like, yep, that's me for sure. So I had a bit of a brainstorm, um, came up with a bit of a design in my mind. I said, yep, 007 in gold up the top and the Nintendo logos both running down the side of the console. Um, so we spent probably three hours, I reckon, at his place. Uh, his name's Jones. I'll be linking his Instagram page down in the uh, description of this video too. Um, yeah, we spent a couple of hours just getting the stencils cut out and he taught me how to actually apply them and just a few good uh, tips and tricks. So um, that was really cool. Um, but yeah, as I say, like getting those stencils is probably the hardest part if, if you don't know anyone who can make them. Um, I think you can get the machines themselves for like about 500 bucks and you probably need a bit of software and then the vinyl um, as well and then the backing. So to actually set yourself up with one of those machines and I think getting the stuff itself is half the battle the other half is learning how to use it okay so next up we're going to be putting the stencils on so i've obviously got the red down and the gold down um it's starting to take shape i guess in some sort of a way um so I was lucky enough to uh, have an Instagram follower of mine uh, after I posted a photo of the fact that I fixed my Nintendo 64 and I said to everyone, hey, I should do some paintwork on it. I had this guy from here in Perth, his name's Jones, and I do recommend checking him out, at least on Instagram. If you are from Perth and you want some, uh, or even around Australia, if you want some uh, forks or anything off a... Uh, um, push bike painted to custom paint he's really good at it so he's obviously got a stencil cutter so he's really uh, handy on the computer he's like really quick on it so I was pretty uh, blown away by um, yeah the work that he did uh, even for me um, <clears throat> but yeah we sat down for a couple of hours and uh, cut some uh, stencils out so I'll see if I can get you up here okay so in this book here I've got some stencils that me and Jones cut out um, he did say to be careful. Once you've cut these stencils, they uh, are prone to move a little bit. Um, so he recommended putting them in a book. And they look to be in pretty good nick still. They haven't gone and warped or um, the backing hasn't gone and peeled off or anything. So we've got a 007, we've got a Nintendo. And, oh sorry, two Nintendos. So we can put the book aside for now. Oh yeah, well, while you're at it, that's actually a pretty cool um, book there worth having so now he recommended to get these what's going on with that focus he recommended to um, give these a bit of a, a push down so that when you're peeling it off uh, the stick is actually going to be stuck onto the backing he said to um, go from the inside out 
otherwise sometimes they can start crinkling up a little bit um, yeah probably usually used a, um, a credit card or something like that but I didn't really feel the need to show over on my credit card on this occasion <coughs> Double O seven in the gold up the top there. <coughs> and the couple of Nintendo logos. Now this next step can get a little bit tricky and he did give me a airbrush needle. So these airbrush needles are quite handy to do little bits of picking with these stencils. So when I um, take this back into work tomorrow, I'll make sure I do take that stencil so that once I'm ready to peel the, um, the sticker off or the, the stencil off, I'll just be able to get it up there nice and, um, yeah, nice and neat rather than trying to pick it out with your fingers or even a razor blade, you know. The next step is to actually just take this backing off. So I'll do the 007 first, start off with that. So you you're best off sort of keeping that at a low angle. Sometimes it does sort of start to come back with the backing and not stay on the... And this is where these... This is where these come in handy. If it starts peeling back you can just gently stick it back down. And that came off quite nice really. I'm pretty happy with that. It's all looking to be in the right spot. Hold on, that needs a little bit of a lift up. So that's it. And get the console over. <coughs> So I'm not going to measure this up or anything, I'm just going to do my best to get it in what looks like to be the middle. As easy as that. Next up, we'll get these Nintendos on. Ah, so that's another thing to think of which end that you're pulling them from. And this one, <coughs> because of the letters, like I don't want that those E's to peel up if I'm pulling it from that end, so I'll come from this end. <coughs> that looks awesome already. <coughs> So let's get back into it. So now I've got all that masking down, I've got the stencils down, just making sure there's no air pockets uh, just on the edge. Like if there's an air pocket in that uh, stencil on the inside of the stencil itself, as long as it's not right on the edge, it should be pretty right. Um, you don't have to go crazy pushing all those air bubbles out or anything. Um, but yeah, I'm just using a high powered white, so HP white. Uh, it is 870 in standoff solvent. Um, just to make sure I get that uh, good coverage. Um, most paint systems have at least two whites, uh, two standard whites. One's just a diluted white and one's a full, full powered white. Um, the last thing I wanted was a pink logo because I didn't get enough, uh, a pink background because I didn't get enough of the white over the top of that red. Um, 
And later on in the video, when I was doing the flow coding, I did notice that the uh, white section, the white next to the red was a lot thicker than the black next to the red. Um, because like black covers really well, white doesn't usually cover quite as good. And um, just to be sure, I did want to make sure I put an extra coat on. So I'm just using that heat gun again. Like I'm just doing this base coat stage in the workshop. The booths were both full. And for base coat, yeah, I mean, there's such a small section of base coat, you're going to be pretty safe. So here we are putting our plastic primer and primer adhesion levels to the test. And as you can see, it definitely passed because, uh, yeah, the last thing that you want to do is go and peel your masking off and have all your primer and stuff peel off with it. Um, as you can see, that was not the case. So the methods are sound and they do work. Follow these steps and you should be able to achieve the same results. At the end of the day, it's just like painting any plastic part, any spray painter should know most of this video really it's not going to be that difficult it's fairly simple really um just follow your basic procedures that you um obviously already know um and yeah look you can get some really awesome results and um, i'm so glad that i was able to get these stencils like without it it would have i don't know it would have been relatively boring i was thinking of doing some sort of a um a holographic flake or something which would have looked okay but nothing on this you know so yeah, just masking back off that white and then we're going to be applying the black down. Just giving a, a little bit more of a sand over that logo just to make sure there wasn't any um, imperfections and over the rest of the case itself, just that base coat, make sure it hadn't gone dry or anything because I wasn't actually painting that section. So a bit of that overspray is prone to sometimes uh, go, go on a little bit dry and a bit sandy. Um, they say you've got 24 hour window between base coats. So if you, if you put your base coat on, you've got 24 hours to re-clear it. And this is definitely um, within that time frame. So this was the Tuesday. I got the red and the gold down on the Monday night, came home, uh, put the stencils on Tuesday morning, put the white down, um, then masked it back up. And I think this is around the lunch break time on the Tuesday or morning tea, something like that. Again, using the R150, and as you can see, um, I'm just using straight black. Didn't want to go any metallics or anything. Um, and it was uh, super deep black, which in Standox range is 897, is the product code. You can see like it's basically covered after your first coat and as I say like I'm not trying I'm trying not to overload it like I don't want to um, build those edges up any more than I need to I just want to get coverage and leave it So before you go and pull these stencils off, um, I've been told like at least an hour, because uh, what can happen is you can start to get um, a little bit of the paint starting to peel back and you can get like a nasty edge there if you don't make sure that base coat's like nice and dry. So yes, this must have been morning tea time because I do remember peeling those uh, stencils off on my lunch break. So I left it for like a good two hours before I peeled those stencils off. And this is where that uh, another place where the airbrush needle does come in handy. Jones gave that to me. Um, originally, I'm like, oh no, I've got an airbrush. I'll just use mine. Then I'm like, uh, you know, it's probably just going to be easier to have one that's just dedicated as a picking tool rather than having to pull it out of my airbrush every time I need it. So. Um, first time he bought an airbrush he got a really cheap one like black ridge i think they do them at super cheap or something like that and he said they were absolute garbage and they just simply didn't last so he kept the the needles out of them and they're handy to use for peeling your stencils and masking up in those delicate areas so i did speed this uh part of the video up this is four times speed but this is really one of the um the awesome moments of doing 
uh, the stencil work. Like when you start peeling it off and you, you can see what it's gonna uh, look like when it's done, it's yeah, pretty special time. <laughs> Good time to be alive. Yeah, I, I did start speeding parts of the video up towards the end, like, because when I was doing the editing side, I'm like, man, this video is getting quite long, but I didn't want to break it up into two or three videos. I just thought, get get it in one video. If people want to um, watch it over two or three sittings, they can. That's fine. If they want to sit down for the 40 or so minutes and watch the entire thing, well, that's also fine. I'm not one to go and put intermissions in the middle of my video where you can go and have something to eat. I think we all know where the pause button is, so... The clear I'm using is DNA Custom Paints uh, Custom Clear, quite a good clear. It's a four to one clear. So um, as I pointed out just there, like you read the side of the can and uh, check the uh, the mixing ratio. So this one doesn't require any reducer. Um, it's got a really nice build to it, but it seems quite thin in the can. One of the other clears that DNA did was called the Diamond Clear, another good clear, a clear clear. Um, some clears are quite yellow, but that's one thing I'll definitely give uh, props to, to DNA is that their clears are actually clear. Like, especially when you're doing custom work, you don't want a yellow tinge to your clear. Like, you want those whites, you want whites to look white. You want uh, blacks to look black without that yellow tinge through it. Um, you know, when you're doing automotive refinishing, a little bit of a yellow tinge isn't the biggest deal. Um, it can be sometimes on the lighter colors when you're doing a blend because um, yeah even one coat of clear can be enough to change that color but especially when you're doing custom work you really want to clear clear so yeah it's starting to look pretty awesome um, and one of the next stages is going to be painting all the um, the switches and the reset button and on and off switch um, and originally I didn't want to take that motherboard into work. I was just like a bit worried about like ruining it again because it was ruined to start off with. I didn't want to take it into work. Um, so I was going to leave the surrounds of the controller ports gray. And then as I got further on in the job, I'm like, nah, they have to go gold. They're going to have to go gold. So I took it in and just put a piece of paper over it to make sure that I didn't get um, any more dust on it than you know I absolutely had to um, and yeah as it turned out it worked out fine it still continued to work so yeah just two coats um, I did put an extra little bit of clear over the stencils so I did smash just an extra heavy coat over the where the stencils were so it gave me enough to actually sand it down um, but once I got the first coat uh, first two coats of clear onto the top of this I'm like okay Half the battle's over now, you know, I've got all the masking and the, the triple colours down. I can put that to the side, I'll then go and paint all the smaller parts, like the base of the console. Um, and I think I mentioned it in the start of the video, I decided not to two-pack prime it and sand it all down because base of the console, especially underneath, it doesn't matter if it's 100% perfect and fully flat. Um, same with all these things, they just get plastic primer and paint straight over it as you would any standard bumper bar. Colour straight over it, couple of coats of clear, job done. And, and again, you can probably notice that I have sped the video speed up just to get through this video. Um, another side of it, it, it does get quite a mammoth task to actually sit down here and narrate it. But um, as I said, it's, it's good to actually have a long project and a big project that I'm keen to actually show the world, you know. Um, this is the kind of thing I want to get to do more of. I really do enjoy doing it. Um, I bought a home recently, but I bought it back in uh, country Victoria, where I'm from. I'm now living in Perth, and once I get that thing paid right down, I'm going to go move over there and even just start working three-day weeks so that on, on my time off, I can actually do a little bit more of this kind of thing and make more YouTube videos. That's my end goal anyway. Um, so I can actually get some more custom work up on the channel. I'd like to learn how to airbrush, but at this point in time, I kind of don't feel like I have the time, you know, between managing this YouTube channel, my own life and work. You know, you do also need some R&R &R time yourself too. So if you're working all the time, it just starts to wear you down after a while. But if I had an extra couple of days each week, you'd yeah, probably get that extra time to learn how to airbrush. I've got some good uh, DVDs and literature, literature on uh, how to learn airbrushing, so 
I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely capable of learning it. I just don't feel I have the time at this point in time. So yeah, just using 800 grit here, and I gave those logos and the um, yeah the areas that got the stencils just a good extra sand down to make sure it's nice and flat for when we give it the flow coat. Got it in the booth there, tack ragging it again, sped sped the footage up a little bit here just to get through that vid. Um, I didn't even uh, wax and grease remover it before I flow coated it, and as you'll see in a minute, it's clean. There's no silicon or anything through it, so yeah, you, you don't always have to wax and grease everything before you paint it. Um, but obviously, before I started working on it, you did notice that I wax and grease removed it. Um, if this was like a full panel and I was uh, working on it and flow coating, yeah, absolutely, I would wax and grease remove it. But for something like this, I didn't want little bits of wax and grease remover. Uh, or perhaps I'll ending in the crevices, not getting wiped off properly. It could actually quote, do more harm than good. Um, and also a plastic part, you can end up getting uh, a static charge to it. So if you go and wipe it down with a wax and grease remover, the, the rubbing over it can actually start static in it up. And then all the dust in the spray booth or the workshop or wherever you're painting it will actually get attracted to it and you'll have crap all through it. So um, yeah, I think not doing that stage in this instance was definitely a good thing um so here we are back at home again th this video isn't about how to remove and refit it i have um included some links down in the description of my personal favorite gaming channels and specifically adam Kralik. he does show you guys how to remove and refit all the parts off a nintendo 64. So yeah, check out all those links down below. I don't usually do that, but for this one, I decided to. Make sure you check out Steaker's Retro Corner too. Absolutely love that guy's stuff. He's got a really cool channel. And um, yes, if you're into this kind of thing, Steaker's Retro Corner and Metal Jesus Rocks, you should love them. So you can see that the reset button is actually working quite well now. That comes up nice and freely without any resistance whatsoever. Um, the power button is a little stiff, but it's definitely functionable. You can see it doesn't take too much to um, put that up and down, and it, it does actually work. So when I first got it back from um, from work, when it was quite fresh, it was actually a little bit sticky. Um, I was hoping that it didn't get worse when it dried down, but it actually got better, so that's a good thing. Awesome. Totally awesome. I'm wrapped with how this thing came out. It's really clean, like there's no dust or D-nibs or anything in it. I actually just saw the tiniest, tiniest little bit. You probably won't even be able to see it on that camera. Oh, you can just see it there. But that's mint. I love it. Some people have said on Twitter and that that they don't like the Nintendo logos. But at the end of the day, design is completely up to you. I was thinking they might have actually looked good with the red as gold instead um, and continued on with the the theme of the rest of the system but the way I look at this like to me it looks like a, a racing car livery nearly like if Nintendo did sponsor like a NASCAR back in the you know uh, late to mid to late uh, 90s they'd probably make it look something like that um, I personally think it's totally awesome and um, yeah I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video if you did, make sure you hit subscribe. We're going to do a separate video on the controllers as well. Stay tuned for that. And until the next one, get out there and paint some shit. Thanks for watching, and this has been another Gunland production. Goodbye.